Welcome back to our next episode of the Dog on Truth about rescue. We're going to be diving into Wichita today, which is a topic we've been on and off discussing with our past podcast, but this one is going to be dedicated directly to it and what's happening out there. So we have three wonderful women with Sarita and I, Jen, okay, and Jen Dolsky <laughs> as well. <laughs> So if you guys want to go around and introduce yourselves and your connection to always and forever and kind of how long you've been with the Wichita um, situation. So whoever wants to go first, Kathy, I'm looking at you. So okay, I'll go first. My name is Kathy Copeland and um, I have been a follower of um, always and forever for several years, but not really actively involved until I would say the last year I got particularly interested in um, always and forever situation with trying to get the conditional use permit was kind of outraged that it didn't work out and started following a lot more carefully after that. And I believe strongly in the, the mission. Shortly after I started kind of getting involved, I had some conversations with Jen at times about the situation in Wichita. And I think what really spurred me into trying to do something and jumping in full, full blast was conversation that I had with Jen just about all the euthanasia that was taking place, and even the methods that were being used in Wichita. I spent a couple of nights, couldn't sleep, just thinking about all of that. Thought something's got to change. So here I am. Well, thank you, thank Kathy. You we'll go. What's that? Oh, oh I was just going to say thanks for that, Kathy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Kelly, if you want to go next. All right. So I'm Kelly Fry, and I'm the intake coordinator. Um, with Always and Forever. And I've been with the team for a couple of years now doing intake, I think almost two years. So excited that I've been kind of in the same role for two years with a outstanding organization that I absolutely love and have a passion for. Here's where I jump in. Okay. <laughs> Let yeah, me but... jump in here. Okay. You guys know me. I'm Jen. And um, I just think this was an incredibly important topic because what has happened over the course of the last year is that it has become so much more than just always and forever's effort to try to change Wichita. And what we have found is that our intake coordinator, Kelly, who has daily, literally daily, nonstop morning, noon, night interactions with other rescues behind the scenes because we're not allowed to pull. We, you know, we were we were ultimately forced out because of an agreement that says we would not publicly post anything that spoke against either Wichita Animal Shelter or Kansas Humane Society or say or note that it was a high kill shelter or that one of the animals had a death sentence. So while we were forced out of saving lives, we found different ways to be involved. And one you know, there are there are lessons and blessings and everything. And it is very, very hard to say that there are blessings out of euthanasia and a, a shelter that was such a low, low kill shelter when Beauties was involved there to now a high kill shelter. One of the blessings is that we have drawn and become a community of advocates working together. So tonight you have Kathy, Kelly, and Conley, all from different areas where we're drawn together for the same purpose. And that truly is to ignite change. And Sai and Sheila, I've, I've, I shared this with our little advocacy group before. I found a terrible podcast and it said how to change a bill. And it was literally the worst podcast ever. And I shared it with the group. And it basically said, because the guy's voice was so monotone and like you want, <laughs> but ultimately the only thing I remember from that was that a 10 year old girl had a passion in her heart. And whenever you get, I, I truly believe passion is energy for your soul. When, when you have something in your soul that ignites your passion and you're drawn together for a reason, that brings people to come together and do extraordinary things. So we started this little advocacy group where maybe I don't know how to change the law. Maybe I don't know how to change and inspire people, but Conley has a background in advocacy which is so cool because it draws together people with different strengths to come and say, hey, here, here's what I know. Here's my background. Let's come together weekly and let's find a way to change. So that's a little background of everybody that's on here. I'll, Conley, and I'll just punt it to you now to share um, yeah. because go ahead. Hi. And as Jen said, my name's Conley Reese. Um, I am from Wichita originally and I moved back here just, I guess it's been two years ago. And last summer, 
I figured out how bad things were at the Wichita Animal Shelter. And I literally started praying about it. There's got to be something I can do. There's got, and I kept thinking, this can't be as bad as it's coming across. There's got to be some answers. And so, um, kind of roll forward, I ended up being involved in a lost and found, it's lost and found pets in the Wichita and surrounding area. And I'm a moderator on that group now. And so I started getting even more insight and constantly having people that lost their dogs, found them at the shelter, and then was starting to help bail dogs out because one of our issues is that we have a lot of really high fines and and a lot of times people Mm. can't even afford. So dogs die there because their owners cannot afford to get them out. And so I got to go into the shelter and help people get their dogs out. And then as time rolls on, I kept thinking there's got to be something I can do because I kept realizing it's worse. It's worse than I imagined. I do. I've never volunteered with Always and Forever. I found them because they came in. You guys came in and saved a dog that I was on my heart because we had been tracking it for days and days and kept forgetting reports of this dog being found. And it finally was shot and always and forever ended up being the ones that came in and pulled that dog and I, and, and rescued it. And so I have fostered with beauties and beasts since I've been here. And so I stayed involved in that. Like I said, I've lost and found. And then last May, I was allowed along with another friend of mine to go into the Wichita animal shelter in the time frame that our city had been cyber attacked. And so we no longer were getting, yeah, we were no longer able to see the pictures of the dogs that were on 24 Pet Connect. So people didn't even know what dogs were there at the shelter. They allowed us to come in. I went in thinking I was going to go in and be allowed to take pictures because you're not allowed to take pictures at the shelter or a video. And so I was allowed to come in and take pictures. And what happened was every single moment I was in there without looking for it, I found things that were wrong, not just the processes and what was happening, but really almost the mentality there at the shelter. And um, I thought I would find more people that were really fighting to save these dogs. And I just, that's not it. It's not there. And so I finally was involved and was asked to kind of join this group with Jen. And it was just a group trying to figure out what to do about the Wichita. And that's when all of a sudden I realized why God put me there through three weeks of hell at the shelter and why I have all these pictures of all these dogs that are dead that are on my phone and all these puppies that are dead and kitty cats that are dead. It was because my background is in advocacy. I realized that that was the key. We needed grassroots. We need to give everybody away because what I heard over and over again, every day people would say to me, I couldn't do what you're doing. I couldn't go into the Mm -hmm. shelter. Not even just every day, but they literally won't even go into the shelter because they can't face it. But those same people would love to be able to help change it. And our shelter used to actually be a place that when we had a lost dog that someone found or a cat, we could comfortably say, take it to the shelter. But last month, 32% of the dogs were killed and 44% of the cats were killed. So we, as part of the lost and found group, are scrambling every time we get a message saying that they've found kittens or puppies like this morning. We are running to sites where they say that there's a deceased cat or a dog. We go out there as volunteers and scan them because we're concerned that they won't be scanned by animal control and owners will never find out that their pets died. We scan and take pictures. It's just, it's really something that I know we can make be better. I know we were better. We used to be better. But there really is, there's a culture at our Wichita Animal Shelter that we need to change. I think you hit on so many things. Sorry, Sheila, I'm yeah. jumping in. Because I know, I was. I almost tried to beat you to it. I almost no, did. We, oh, <laughs> we were better because of the rescue that was in there. So we always have to give recognition to Beauties and Beasts. What they did for nine years, Conley, you hit the nail on the head. Nobody can do Nobody can experience the trauma they experienced because I I was in that shelter. I've been in the shelter a handful of times. And Kathy, you know, and Kelly, your first impressions of the shelter, you cannot walk in there and leave unaffected. You cannot walk in there and sleep comfortably at night knowing that you have to do something to change this. It affects you. It affects your principles. It affects your morals. You take that home. 
and to work there day in and day out where every single day, half of the animals are, are going to be euthanized. You are not getting people that care about these animals as if they are souls. They are truly inventory. And I have said that many, many times. And, and that's why Conley is absolutely right. This episode, this, this podcast, our entire movement is to create awareness awareness within the city of Wichita. Um, we're going to have a rally. I, I believe it's October 18th. 1,300 animals have been euthanized through August 19th. That's today's date in Wichita Animal Shelter. And we're going to place 1,300 collars on the city hall's steps to symbolize every single animal. Now, this is October, so sadly, it will be more. But I mean, there's so much more to add on this that I, I know others have opinions on, but I truly won't dominate this podcast, I promise, because people know me. I'm just going to ask, so is it still closed to public? So you said that usually you can't go in and take pictures and videos, and it was just during that cyber time. Is it still like that, that you can't go in? No, you, it's it's open to public. You can go in, you show your ID, and you can go back and look for your dog or cat. Um mm -hmm. And but you cannot take pictures. Um, there's a sign up that you're not allowed to take pictures or videos. You can go in. It was just that. Because I know, Jen, when we talked about it before, when I first found out the difference between kill shelter and non kill shelter was the 10 percent. And we were talking about that number. So to hear you say 32 and 44 percent is astronomical compared to months ago when we talked about it. So I guess just the biggest difference between then and now of why that has increased so much. Well, I mean, it is 100% because rescues aren't in there and that affects completely. Kelly. But that's been, a, that's been a few months, right? When was the last one that got pulled out? Probably us. I mean, mm -hmm. that were really truly dedicated to mm -hmm. um, taking those pictures because, you know, one of our, and well, Greta, who helped us do so many pictures and get to know the dog and pull the dog out of the, kennel and really get to know that personality, even just for a couple of minutes to get a dog out of a kennel and to really see their little personality shine versus being caught behind a kennel and so scared behind those closed doors. Um, it's amazing the how fast we were not able to help when all of a sudden we weren't in there anymore. And the only pictures that we were able to have were the intake pictures, which are not acceptable if you want my opinion, because when they first yeah. come in, it's either from the top or it's through the cage or it's through the bars. And most of the time, a gray dog looks brown or a brown dog, you know, it's never, they never look like the true animal that is missing. And then on top of that, if, if this dog is a stray and really has no home to be able to promote that dog to other people, to see this beautiful individual who's in there and just needs our help, to get that information out to the masses. And then like Conley, your whole group, having so many people on the group, whether they're looking for a dog or not, I think a lot of people have now gone to your page because they want to help. They want to help get these animals back to their owners. So it's now people seeing dogs in need that may go back to their own. It's also people that, okay, well, I could help that dog. You know, I may not be the owner, but now where did that dog help it? So it's amazing how not having people in there has really jeopardized all of them. They, we don't, even as rescues, I know a handful of dogs that are in there, but unless we're in there, we don't know all of them. And so unfortunately, so many of them die without even, they're dying with a number. And that is one of the things that I always told myself, I, it, saying that out loud really hurt. I hate having dogs have numbers. It's not right. And they die and they're not promoted and it's really hard. Because they've changed the time frame, correct? On the amount of days they'll keep them once they're... Yeah, they, they changed. They went back to the three days, which is the the state requirement. And, okay. you know, I honestly, I'm okay with that because the quicker we can get them out. The problem is, and what I saw while I was there, is that I started interacting with these dogs. And then I would hear or see an assessment done by Kansas Humane Society, who comes is the only one that has the ability to go in there and really interact with the dogs and share the dogs that need saved. And I, one of them in particular, this dog was jumping and crazy and kind of wild and really wasn't friendly the first time I walked past. But just by 
spending just a few minutes every day and it's starting to trust me. I, I read what it said and it was going to be rescue pull only. And I'm like, this is a beautiful dog that is just going crazy in that kennel. And I, I sat down in front of its kennel and started talking to it and was able to shoot a video and share it. And that dog is in a loving home now. And it would have been euthanized. And it was literally just because what people knew about it and all the, the only thing that our rescues do know about these dogs is very minimal. And it's what the Kansas Humane Society shares on them. Any dog that's in there, if it's not returned to owner, it will be assessed by the Kansas Humane Society. If the dog is over five years old, they aren't going to pull it. There, it's I, I literally could tell which dogs they were going to do just by the few weeks I was in there. Within the first week, I could tell which ones were going to need saved that were going to be at risk of euthanization. If there's any health issues, that's always at all. That's a no. They're not going to go to Kansas Humane Society to have a chance at adoption there. And um, they're going to go, they're going to need a rescue, but the rescues aren't able to get in there. They have to sign the contract that Jen was talking about that came into effect last September. Right. And so with that, these dogs are sitting in there and not having the interaction. There is zero below zero enrichment in these dogs lives, none. And so, and in the past, we always had to wait until Kansas Humane Society had done an assessment before the rescues really could do anything to come in and save a dog. And so it's hard. I know we need to stay focused. Um, there's so, like I said, I spent weeks in there and every time I turned around, I saw another problem. It was heartbreaking. You know, it, Jen, can you recap on for, if so, this is the first episode someone's listening to about why the shelters were pulled out or not the shelters, but the yeah. rescues. So it, this is a very interesting situation. Um, Years back, a, an individual donated two buildings to the city. So on one side, you have Wichita Animal Shelter. And on the other side, you have Kansas Humane Society, who is renting that building from the Wichita, the city of Wichita. I believe it's for $1 a year. In exchange for that building, they take the Kansas Humane Society takes in all of the owner surrenders within the city of Wichita and Wichita Animal Shelter is run by the police and animal control and a lieutenant, et cetera. And they take in all of the stray dogs and cats. So what you have is there's an agreement in place that gives Kansas Humane Society the ability to assess the behavior of each dog and cat. And they determine if that animal is deemed adoptable. What's very important is to them. So ultimately, if you think big picture, this was modeled after a shelter that used this in San Diego and one other place, both of those models failed 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whenever this happened, no longer in existence like that. But the thought was you have a nonprofit shelter over here, you have the police running and taking the strays there and all the animals that they can take, they bring to that building. In theory, that's great. Ooh, look, a nonprofit, a lot of lives are saved. In reality, what happened was if you have an animal shelter that is picking and choosing every single animal that they deem adoptable and selling them with no requirements, no background checks, nothing, price tag on the dog or the cat to the public, what you have is a nonprofit doing a for-profit business without the best interest of the animal at heart. And what you have, and this is what Beauty saw a bunch of leftovers at the Wichita Animal Shelter. That's what I call them. We are literally fighting for the leftovers, the ones Kansas Humane Society cannot save because they're not promoting them. They're not putting them on Facebook. Social media is God's greatest gift to rescue animals. Um, Conley's Lost and Found page, I think you have 30,000 people on that. It gives wow. the average person an ability to truly be a hero and make a difference because not everybody can go in that shelter. So what you found was beauties nine years ago went in there and said, okay, we see that you don't want these leftovers. They're all just dying. We're going to go in there. We're going to put our whole team in there. We're going to suffer the PTSD, the trauma. We're going to watch all of this and we're going to fight for every single animal you don't want. Now what happened they're forced out of there. They saw too much trauma. They saw things that they protested and they said, this is wrong. 
and they were forced out. They were silenced. So what happened? Always and forever steps in, right? Same exact thing happens. Kansas Humane Society in October, as of October 1st, puts this agreement in place and says, if you say anything bad about us or Wichita Animal Shelter, you're not allowed to be in Wichita Animal Shelter and you are not allowed to save a life. Tell me there is logic behind that. Tell me that this isn't driven by profit and motive and silencing people who are speaking up for the voiceless. And that's why when Conley or Kathy or Kelly or anybody goes in there and they see something wrong, they just stop them from going in there versus changing. So ultimately, we have to say, guys, even if you're not in Wichita, you need to care about Wichita because if this is happening in Wichita, it is happening everywhere. And it takes Mm. one person to say, it's not enough to demand change. We have to be that change. And that's why we have this grassroots movement going. And that's why, so for so many times when we talked about Wichita before, you would ask me, what would, what should we do? And my Mm. answer would be, I don't know. (laughs) It was true. I, and that's where calmly, I think, okay, let's, let's say this. What, what should we do? What should people do right now? So that's where I came in with the advocacy thing, because it's not that hard. We have, so I'm just going to cut it down to like the city of Wichita. We've got six districts in the city of Wichita. We are building a grassroots effort and we're going to have leaders in each of those districts. And we've already are making contact with the city councils. They are already listening to us. They are already making some changes because they know that that we're getting the word out. We're going to have it to where easy access to get information to your city council people. That's They have the power. They truly are the ones that have the power to change things at the animal shelter in Wichita. Beyond that, we're also going to hit Cedric County. So one person in each district, that person's going to have five people that they have with them that are going to be the ones that make the calls, do the emails, whatever that is, whatever we've got that we need to focus on at that time. And then that person is going to have five people under them. All of a sudden, we've got 20 messages going into city council and they're listening to us. It's that easy. Those of you that vote, I commend you for going out and voting. That is the minimum that we should be doing when it comes to making a difference. Um, This is a democracy. We have power. We don't use our power. So together, doing the grassroots, we can do that. And so it's that simple. We're going to have more times. Like she said, October 18th, there's a rally. On that day, if you can't be there that day, we want you sending a message to your city council. That's going to that's gonna help. We've got statewide issues too, huge statewide issues that we're facing. And soon we will have the information of the people that we need to connect with. And so in those districts um, at the state level, we can do the same thing. It's just that easy. Anybody that has a connection with an elected official, awesome. If you have a connection with them and a passion to help animals, reach out to us. Even if you don't have a connection with them, if you're a constituent of anybody, which every single one of you are a constituent of somebody, if you're here in the United States, you're going to have some power, especially here in Kansas. We're going to help you. That's huge. That's a much better answer than what we've had in the past. (laughs) We've talked about Wachita. Well, I mean... I've always said, I don't know. <laughs> so it is a better answer. But Jed, you've always done such an amazing job of finding the people that do know. So kind of what you spoke about before, like if you don't know something, like you're not an advocacy, but there are people that do do that well, every day or have a passion for it I, that also I happen to love animals. We were able to meet as a group, was it three weeks ago, I think, in Wichita, we had a meal together and talked about the problems. I felt like we're finally telling people something that they can do. But just prior to that dinner, I got to have my walk through the Wichita Animal Shelter. And so my only time, I went and gave him my ID and, and told him I was looking for a, a lost dog, which, you know, had to have a reason to go in. What I found out later was that they had killed a lot of animals that day or the day before. So when I walked in there, I saw a lot of empty cages and I thought, well, this doesn't look too bad, you know, um, and it's clean and there's water in the buckets. And but there was the few animals that were left were like the dogs that were just laying on the ground so depressed or they were losing their minds in the kennel. The, the little kittens just, oh, my gosh, that just broke my heart because they're so cute and happy. And you know that their lives are going to just be snuffed out. So I came out of there in tears 
the bright spot, the hope was, as I was going in with another person from our group, there was a young woman walking a dog to the shelter. And Kelly (laughs) jumped in and ran up to her. And by the time I got back out, they had made arrangements with that girl to not take the dog in as a stray to relinquish to the shelter. But instead, she that dog went to um, one of our trusted vets, came to can to our area and was, I think it's in a home, like a foster home now. Beautiful brindle dog. And it's like you have to hang on to those bright spots or the images in your head will kill you. You know, it's funny on that because the takeaway from saving the life, and this is where I think a lot of rescuers and a lot of people get caught and then just quit, is that at that exact moment, a young couple brought in a kitten in a box and not one of us jumped to get the kitten. And I, I share this not to shame anyone because I was the same exact way. I'm, I Everybody was like, let's save the dog. And we thought after the fact, my God, why didn't we save the kitten too? And so you, you torture yourself over the one you didn't save versus a flawed system where thousands are being euthanized. But those are personal experiences. And once this touches you personally, this is where you can't stop. And why would you wait for it to be your dog or cat to be euthanized when every single animal is God's animal? And the only thing that I'm going to jump in and share is that I didn't start this advocacy group. (laughs) Um, Let me be very, very clear about that. I do believe everything is a God thing. Just like you said, Conley, you're meant to be here. I didn't even know what advocacy was. Beth McCree walked up to me one day and she said, I'd like to do advocacy. And I said, okay, great. I don't think we do that. I don't know. I don't know. I, the words just, all right? I'm like, yeah, like, that feels very formal. And if you're like me, you're like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. But when you break it down kindly and you just say, hey, we can do this, you start emailing people. And one thing I did want to share too is once I found out the RFP, the request for proposal that we submitted to the city of Wichita when we thought they were looking for someone to take over the shelter, once I found that was dead in the water in February, every single week for five months, sometimes twice a week, I emailed the city. (laughs) I emailed the lieutenants in charge. And then I started adding city council, the mayor, the city manager. And I said, this is wrong. let us help. And we offered to vaccinate every single animal in there for free at no cost to the city. We offered to put our staff in there for free to take photos. We offered to do everything to help them. And not one offer was taken. And here we are today with 1,300 lives lost. That's not including the ones from October, November, and December of last year. So no, there are many, many, many more, because I think it was 40% or higher that died in October when rescues were forced out. So it's been almost a year since rescues were forced out. Yeah, will be October. 10 months, 11 months, 10 months. And and there was also, um, last month, we did find out that there was an inspection done, a state inspection, and there was a lot of issues, a lot of problems that needed to be addressed. And some of them were existing problems that had already been brought up at the shelter. And I helped the dog get out Friday. It was a deemed dangerous dog. And I know everybody's like, oh, well, deemed dangerous. I'm glad they're getting those dogs off the street. Well, there's about 30 of them sitting in the Wichita Animal Shelter currently. Some of those dogs, what this dog killed a cat that came onto the property that it was at. That dog was in there for over a month. It lost over 30 pounds. It has sores on its testicles and on its paws. It lost over 30 pounds. There was a request Friday, the day that we got the dog out. And they did work with us. They, I don't, it was almost a miracle that we got it out and they reduced the level, but there's over 30 dogs in there and they're those deemed dangerous dogs. They could be a little schnauzer that nipped somebody and and they can die from it because of, so there, like I said, there's so much wrong, but what I really thought that was problematic of the dog I helped out Friday was the health that it was in. It was, it's horrendous. And they had other things that were written written up on them last month um, on other dogs that, should have had vet care that haven't had it. When I was there in in May, tons of times that the dogs didn't have water. Not all of them, but I have lots of pictures of dogs that had water bowls that were tipped over that were empty and the and the floors were dry. So I can't even imagine. 
Do we know how often are the dogs walk? They're never. Um, so once a dog goes into the Wichita Animal Shelter, they are intake and they go into a kennel. That is their existence. Um, the, in, the, the kennels have what they call guillotines. You can enter the kennel on each side. There's a hallway on each side. And then there's the guillotine is the thing that metal thing that separates them. And so the dog is on one side of the kennel and then spends its day there. The next morning, they will put food and water in the other side and they open the guillotine, shoo the dog over to the side with the food and water, shut it back up, and then they clean the area that it spent the entire day in. They The only time they get out is Has if, this- Kansas, if Kansas Humane Society decides to come and evaluate. If they think they're a dog that they may take, may want to go ahead and transfer to adopt out, then they will take them over to assess them. But I saw them one time take a poodle that they were going to take to assess. I just happened to be standing right there. And this poodle was so excited and they picked it up, realized that it was a little bit older and had a tumor and they put it back in its kennel. That was their full assessment. Kathy, can you share if you know, has this been broadcast on the news? Actually, it's been very strange how the media in Wichita really doesn't have an interest at this point in showing what's going on. You know, I know Jen was interviewed at one point in time, and I think she gave a lengthy interview, and I think they cut her little clip down to just mere seconds. And what's the point? It almost makes you wonder who knows who and and why why is this being covered up? I have Mm -hmm. tried to um, reach out to some of the news people down there with no response, absolutely zero. We're hoping that with the rally that at least we can get some attention focused. Can't ignore 1,300 dog callers. No, and what I see, I really hope you guys do a good um, social media presence on that. That's the stuff that you'll see on TikTok that goes viral and really sparks conversations and engagement from people not in the Wichita area, but we'll get back to the Wichita area, especially when it's, if it does go viral for people to say, oh my gosh, that is happening in my backyard. Like that's not something you want your city to be known for. Because that is going to be such a huge statement to do that in a visual representation. That alone, just seeing the collars. Forget how many people yes. come there. And yeah. image. No, just the collars. collars. Yeah. Are you promoting that to noticed- public to come help? Or is that something you guys are doing Absolutely. on your own? No, we we need you. Okay. We and come here and say this. I, I think we're out of town people. We need everyone. I'm taking the day off. I'll be there. You know, it doesn't matter that I think. The movement we have to engage in Wichita, we've got to get people in the city to realize what's going on. Because just like Kathy said, every time we reach out to the media, they are on my emails. There are reporters that know this. This is a story. Why is it? Why aren't people screaming? And if you think about when you wake up in the news, it's all bad. But <laughs> This is a news story. This fits right in their little world of darkness. And Let's be the light in this. Let's expose this. We do not want to just scream and shout change. We want to be in there and help them do it. That's the difference. That's why we cannot understand the logic behind keeping us out when every single motive that we have is pure, is honest, and is good. And it's meant to not only help the animals, but to help the people there taking care of the animals. My God, the moment I walked into there the very first time, Anybody who doesn't think dogs feel fear or no pain in that sense, emotional pain, take a step into a kill shelter, hear their screams, see them shaking uncontrollably in a corner to where they can't stop, where it's literally body spasms, see them jumping up and down and scream. And then know the next day they're drugged down a hall, kicking and screaming on a catch pole out of pure fear with a human being that I don't know these humans have souls. And I know that's terrible to say, because to do what they do, the way that they do it, that has been documented, that they treat these animals this way, someone needs to speak out and say, this has to stop. And that has to be us. It can't just say you, it has to be us. You have to internalize that. You have to look at your dog behind you and say, this very well could have been them. And I have a moral obligation to speak up for the ones that don't have a voice. They can't. They're screaming. They're screaming at the top of the lungs and nobody is listening. All they do is kick the people out. 
They kicked Conley out. Do you know how many lives she saved in three weeks? Do you know how much trauma Beauties and Beasts went through in nine years? And they made them the villain. All rescues are bad. <laughs> Why? Because we want to help you? Because we want to save lives? Because we want to hold you to the standards of moral, humane care? And we are not saying that every shelter is never going to euthanize. But when you have an insane restriction that says 25% of the kennels have to be open, no matter what, and we're just going to kill the kill, where's no. your soul on that? Where's your there's soul? A le- there's a level of desensitization to the whole thing. It's almost like, well, we talk about animals as being souls and, and we treat them that way. They're just property to them. And sometimes I think they see them as used worn out property that they don't care about well, there's, um, there's the inventory list every day xyz is going to yeah. die abc yeah. what what the very first thing that you know when we did this rfp our one of our first statements was we're going to name every animal <laughs> even if it's not their name you make them a being a presence a life the standard of care is going to be different it truly is do you look at them as a number in inventory or are they a soul? And why not let somebody that cares for them and loves them step in? No matter what rescue they're with, citizen or not, this is a publicly funded, tax-paid municipal shelter. Very, very important. The citizens of Wichita are paying for the police to murder over a thousand animals in eight and a half months. Mm. That's where your taxpayer money is going. If I was in Wichita, you could not keep me out of every single city councilman's office every day. And we've got amazing people that do that. Diana, people writing in. It's more. It's got to be more of us. It's got to be more. I I think all my emails are deleted. I don't live in Wichita. You're not going to get me to stop caring. I truly believe we're here to reform Wichita. And then we're going to Oklahoma City. And we're helping them. <laughs> it's not just about this because we're proving what others deem impossible. It's only impossible if you don't try. And Conley's done it with tobacco. Like I, I think that's really imp- what you shared that story. It's 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 possible. Oh, I was part of when we went clean indoor air act, smoke free in Kansas in 2010. I was the state lead during that time, and it truly was a battle against tobacco, big tobacco. They got big money. Who is our battle against right now? Who was going to fight to keep killing dogs and cats that has a bunch of money they want to throw at it? Nobody. Like we just have to get. We just have to rally and join together and have a message and get it to them. And um, I I will say there are some good people that work at our shelter. They are supervised and the leadership is the problem. That's such a good point, because when I make these generalizations, it doesn't mean that everybody in every kill shelter is bad. And whenever I make a post like that, you get the, the people jumping in there. How dare you? I love my animals. I know there are. Here's the thing, too, you guys. And I say this every single time I do a live, there are very bad people in rescue too. So I'm not just saying that there are bad people in shelters. Know your leadership, know what their mission is, know what their values are, do your research. Where does your hard-earned money go to? Are you donating to a dog and cat selling business or are you truly donating to a rescue or shelter that's saving lives? And where and how is your taxpayer money spent? I think the budget for next year for the Wichita Animal Shelter, isn't it like $5 million, something like that for the animal control in the shelter? It's something high. Whoa. So know, know where your money's going. It's your money. It, it just like kind I think of- such a big misconception too, to so many people. And bringing back the story of when we were there that day that Kathy was talking about, this young lady, you know, looks at me and says, what kind of dog do you think this is? As I'm going back and forth with her and we're talking about, oh, it could be this, it could be this, you know, back and forth. And she goes, okay, so it's not a pit bull. And I said, no, I don't think it's a pit bull. It might have a mix. I don't know, but it's got boxer in it. It's got, you know, we were just kind of laughing and she goes, okay, well, but then it's a good place because they only kill pit bulls there. And I said, is that, is that what you think? And she goes, well, that's what I've always heard. And I was like, no, they will, they will kill this one too. It's it's a large dog who probably won't find a house very fast. All these things that we kind of talked to her and she's like, so they just can kill dogs there? 
you stop and you think, okay, if this young lady who probably, she said she had a cat, so she has a kitty cat. She really doesn't know anything other than that. She thinks it's a shelter where good people work and do good things for animals, but no one really knows what happened. Like we said, until you step in there, because even, I mean, Jenna and I can talk about this, how we had this grandiose idea that beauty's walked away. Okay, well, we're going to, we're going to step in and we're going to see exactly what goes on and we're going to try and do everything they did. And and we're going to do it because that's just, you just pick up where someone else left leaves off. It's amazing how all of a sudden you stop and you're like, wow, I, I knew it was bad. But until you really feel it, when you see it, when you hear it and you witness the things until other individuals start asking those questions and other people start seeing the truth that goes on behind the office area when you walk in that looks clean and welcoming and people are friendly. What goes on behind the closed doors that you can't video? What goes on behind closed doors that you cannot take pictures of? Why? Why do that? Why? If it's such a good place, I would advertise it. If it's such a good place, I would video all of it. Show people what you're really doing. Mm -hmm. I guess until you get in there and you see what's happening, there's a big misconception of truly what a shelter is in Wichita. You know, Kelly, that same day that you were just talking about, before that, a bunch of you guys went to visit Dwight. Talk about Dwight a little bit. Aw, Dwight is a whole nother situation. Jen, maybe you can talk this better than me, but a dog came in as a stray, sat in a kennel for a couple of days with some major injury, was not promoted at first. And then I have some very good connections that sent me the information and said, Kelly, you guys need to do something. This is, this is insane. So sent it to our med coordinator and I was instantly, Julie and I were just like, okay, we're in it. We're doing this. We're, we're getting dead. Let's call her. Yeah. <laughs> and Can I just tell you that at that yeah. exact time, at Conley, I swear it went on. Dwight was on your radar. Dwight was on my radar from somebody else. The three of us in different connections all had someone saying, here's a dog from right. the top of his neck to the bottom of his tail that had severe chemical burns to where there is no, to where it, his skin was bubbling. So think about one tiny burn on your finger from a bubbled and crap, bubbled yeah. and crap. And uh, when we got Dwight to the vet, the vet said, the smell almost made him passed out. He had never smelled anything like this. And this was a dog that had clearly suffered these burns at least a week and a half ago. Now, the Kansas Humane Society vet looked it over, gave him, I believe, one dose of carbprofen and a shot that wears off in four hours on a Friday evening and then said reassess in 48 hours on a Friday, left him over 48 hours over the weekend, no promotion, no reaching out to rescues. Yet I don't know how the three of us, each each of us had a different person reach out and say, 911, save this dog. So it's funny because we all connected at the same time and we're like, we're going to save this dog. But Dwight did not get to the vet until Monday. Now, here's my first thought. Why did you not humanely euthanize this dog if you were not going to help this dog? Period. That was my because, first thought. Yeah, that's everybody's thought. Because if you see these pictures, Very you cringe. Horrible. You cringe. And But here's the thing. Dwight was wiggly. He was happy. He wanted to live. This was a dog that was adopted out by Kansas Humane Society a year ago. They knew this. They looked up the owner. They called them. The owner said that they rehomed them. Kansas Humane Society chose not to take the dog back into their care because they said they didn't have the resources for that and left the dog on Wichita Animal Shelter side with one pain shot that ran out in four hours and one pill. That's it. Look at these pictures. Look Dwight up. Now, there's a beautiful story of this because the vet tech that now is caring for him 